Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AARA's Webinar Wednesday. I'm Jerry DiMaggio, a frequent moderator on the program. I'll be serving as the moderator for today. Our webinar is entitled Mask and COVID-19, A Practical Perspective. Next slide, please. The uh, next few slides will just uh, orient you relative to a few housekeeping items. First of all, um, if you have an issue with your sound and you're using computer speakers, then please dial in using your phone. If you continue to have a problem, then please use the chat button and send a message only to the host. Next slide, please. To ask a question, and we encourage you to ask questions for the entire program, please click as shown on this slide on the Q&A buttons and send your question. In this case, send it to both the host and the panelists. We'll defer answering all questions until the conclusion of the technical program, which will last about 40 to 45 minutes. Next slide, please. To see the presentation at full screen, at the top of your webinar settings, as you can see in the slide shown here, click on the down arrow, I like view, and then choose fit the viewer. Next slide, please. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, be our sole presenter today, Mr. Brian Hanbug. And I'm from Sicily, so I mispronounce all these European names other than those in, from Italy. So Brian has spent the last decade working with the U.S. government agencies, a number of which I won't go give you the entire list, FDA, OSHA, DOD, and he's well prepared to address this webinar because his research has been for over a decade dedicated to developing a respiratory protection system to address the shortage that we all know well due to the particular pandemic that we're dealing with. Brian has uh, led a great deal of research relative to contamination and reuse of filtering face pieces and respirators. He's currently, as you'll hear today in the webinar, uh, a number of the next generation respirators for healthcare workers. Without further ado, as you can see Brian's credentials on this slide, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Brian. Brian? Thanks, Jerry. Uh... Appreciate that introduction. So uh, I assume you can hear me. Can you confirm that, Jerry, before I quit, before I start talking too much here? You're, you're a little low. Okay, right. I will uh, pick up the face piece. Is that better? Okay. So you're anyway. Talking. I'm not hearing anything. Okay. I didn't quite catch that, Jerry, but I'll go ahead and get started. If you can't hear me, then just interrupt me and I'll... Sure, I'll be listening. Go ahead, please continue. Okay. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, obviously with everything that's going on with COVID-19 and masks and respirators, um, and of course we've been following this because it's been our research area again for almost 14 years. Um, we, you know, we're just uh, grateful to be able to share some information we have. There's a lot of misinformation out there that I'm sure many of you are seeing. And just try to provide you some solid foundation so that you can uh, better understand masks and respirators and how they apply to you. So this is kind of the overview, what I uh, hope to go over today. Again, objectives of what we hope you will take from this. Have to talk a little bit about the problem, the spread of COVID-19 to understand how masks uh, mitigate that issue. We'll obviously talk about face coverings. We'll talk a little bit about a source control study we're doing right now for OSHA. Unfortunately, we didn't get too far on that as far as what I hope to do before this presentation. I just saw the data last night, but there's some interesting findings about this talk. Then we'll summarize, take questions, and get you all uh, on your way. So as far as what I hope to provide to you all today is you know, that you can understand the various types of face covers available, understand the pros and cons for each type. 
uh, obtain a practical understanding of some of the research that has been performed. I know, you know, this is a diverse audience, uh, but I know there's also a lot of engineers on the phone, uh, and I'm sure that, um, you know, you've maybe been looking at some of the research out there. A lot of it is available now and uh, free to the, uh, some in peer review, review journals, some in open source journals, but there's a lot of data out there that uh, is very interesting. Understand why source control is important and how it uh, relates to math. That's really a key thing, and I'm sure some of you have heard that, so we'll kind of uh, spend a little bit of time talking about that. And really, hopefully, uh, at the end of this, you can make informed decisions on the types of math uh, and what they really can and cannot do for you. So let's start with the problem, uh, the spread of COVID-19. And I'm, I'm sure you've all, if you haven't seen pictures like this with someone sneezing, <laughs> they're all over the internet. Maybe we see them more because it's kind of in our line of work, but um, it kind of directly relates to the transmission pathways for COVID. And you'll see, notice on the screen, I've made several asterisks and many um, links to different government agencies, particularly the CDC has a wealth of information on there. So a lot of this, uh, what I'm having you, uh, to tell you today is reference back to the CDC um, website. So when we think of transmission pathways for infectious diseases like COVID-19, we generally lump them into three categories. However, there are others, but these would be the three primary categories. And so I'm sure you've heard a lot about droplet transmission uh, out there. And it's really sprays or splashes or close range inhalation of droplets. So if you look at our picture here with this, you know, this guy sneezing, you can see, you know, obviously many droplets have actually impacted the camera here, uh, right? And that would be an example of droplet transmission where liquid droplets are actually transmitted from one person uh, to the next. And of course, you know, you've all been around someone who sneezed and probably felt this uh, very uncomfortably from time to time. So, but that's an example of droplet transmission. You've heard a lot about, additionally, probably about what they uh, talk about aerosol transmission. We also could call this airborne transmission or inhalation. Um, and essentially what happens is a lot of these droplets will dry down to what we refer to as droplet nuclei. So essentially the water evaporates from these droplets and they stay suspended in the air for long periods of time where you essentially inhale them at a later later time. So this could be someone is in their office and they might sneeze or cough. Those droplets dry down to droplet nuclei, and then someone comes in the room at a later date and inhales those droplets, versus droplet transmission, which is close range, and this is happening in real time. I'm standing, you know, a certain distance from someone, and they're actually, you know, contaminating me with droplets. And so those are two distinctions, and again, this is a lot of some misinformation or some misunderstanding in, in the press that I've seen where they talk about, you know, airborne transmission, that really relates to aerosol transmission and not so much droplet. Those are two distinct things. And then contact transmission or touch or fomite. Fomite is a contaminated surfaces that, that serves to transmit disease where you can imagine where our fellow sneezing here, some of his droplets ended up on a surface, a doorknob, a piece of food, or whatever the case may be and that virus remains on that viable on that surface for some period of time and it's transmitted through that through either touching it uh, or directly on the food and maybe you ingest that food so so those are the kind of the three types of drop or I'm sorry of transmission it's important you understand the basics of those uh, because when we get into talk about masks we're going to talk about how uh, different facial protections actually protect against uh, those types of transmission pathways um oh, okay had Right there. Okay, so it's also important to understand, though, that although we have this scenario where we have obvi obvious droplets being produced, um, it's important to understand that droplets are being produced when we just speak and breathe normally. And so, and there's a lot of literature, and this really the literature goes back to the 40s when they've actually started trying to understand the respiratory secretions and things that come out of people's mouths, but. Um, what we do know is the droplets are formed, smaller droplets are formed. So this setup I'll talk about later. This is for our OSHA study. And uh, the mannequin here you see with the head form on is actually um, um, attached to a breathing machine that's actually generating droplets. And so we can either have the, the mask on or the mask off. And then this system here is called the Malvern Spray Tech, Spray Tech, which is a laser diffraction device. So essentially, if this mannequin produces droplets, there's a laser that shines between these two devices and actually measures a droplet distributions in real time. And it only measures liquid droplets. It won't measure dry particles. So, so what we know is if you look at this histogram, this 
mannequin is producing droplets in roughly the 10 to 100 micron size range. These wouldn't really be visible for you to see. Uh, but this actually correlates pretty well with the literature. Again, the literature is all over the place because you can imagine that uh, respiratory droplets produced by one person is different than another person. And even for a, a, a specific person, it'll vary based on their disease state, their level of hydration, what they might have eaten that day, what they might have drank that day or during that time. So it is highly variable, but this is somewhat representative of, of uh, again, the types of droplets that would be produced during, you know, general conversation or during normal breathing. So, so the important point here is, again, while we all know this happens, right, we've, again, felt this or been around this, uh, droplets are being swapped back between people all the time when you're just having normal conversation, even though you can't feel them, even though you can't see them, that's happening all the time. So droplet transmission, again, we'll talk about what that means from the CDC's perspective, um, is, um, is always uh, occurring, this droplet transmission. So, so uh, just an important note there. Okay, so let's talk about, um, again, COVID-19, a little bit in the disease state. So um, you've probably heard this about asymptomatic spreaders or pre-symptomatic spreaders of the disease. And, of course, these are individuals that have no symptoms that spread the disease. And this is not unique to COVID-19. Influenza is the same way where you have asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spreaders. And other diseases uh, would have similar scenarios. But it's important to understand that you can be around someone that's perfectly healthy or uh, at least appears to be perfectly healthy, but they're still shedding the virus and potentially infect, in, infecting others. Uh, so the CDC uh, really defines close contact. So again, if you go back to their standard condition of how do you know when you have to quarantine after you've been exposed to someone, so if I'm around someone that tests positive a day later, um, then I'm supposed to quarantine. But they define a close contact as someone within six feet of an infected person for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period. Now, I don't exactly know where that came from. I, I assume it's based on some empirical data that was collected, but it's largely, um, you know, it's largely the, the criteria that we use in our workplace to define when we have a significant exposure, and I think most people are using this as well. So, so again, going back to this scenario where we have these droplets being spread, you know, from person to person, you can imagine that there's a certain amount of those droplets have a probability of making it to this person, uh, this other mannequin on the other side. And so the CDC's come up with this scenario based on, um, again, some evidence out there that I'm sure that they have looked at. The other issue with COVID-19 is what is the infectious dose? So how many actually virions does it take? So this is a a model of the COVID virus and how many of these does it actually take to infect somebody? And so the CDC um, really has it as unknown on their website and the World Health Organization also has it as unknown on their website. However, most agree it's very small, so call it less than 100 virions, uh, viral particles, if you will, which is typical of viruses. Um, you know, it could be as low as one, uh, but certainly could be in the single digits as well. And this has to do with the way viruses spread in the body versus bacteria, which kind of have a different mechanism. Uh, so viruses in typical, typically would have very small uh, infectious doses. So again, you go back to this whole issue of someone that's infected spreading droplets. It doesn't take a lot of viruses to infect you or a lot of droplets to, cut, to come in contact. And of course, we see this play out now or being played out across around the world on, you know, kind of the out of control pandemic that we have right now. So just to summarize, before we get into respirators, it's really easy to spread the disease through casual contact. Uh, and so that's just, um, we've known that for some time now. And so um, uh, it's important to take away when we start talking about masks. Primarily spread through respiratory droplets. And again, that's not necessarily someone standing in your office sneezing on you. These droplets are constantly being exchanged from person to person. It's just you don't know what's always happening. And, and, and certainly within that six foot range is where the CDC is defined as being uh, critical. And the facial covering are an effective means to limit spread of the disease. We're going to talk about this today. That's certainly my opinion based on the research that we've had. I know there's different opinions out there, but you know, just have you consider that. Um, you know, the disease is spread by respiratory droplets from infected people impacting the respiratory system of uninfected people. So if you limit the spread of those droplets by covering the mouths of both people, you certainly have a means to limit the spread of the disease. And again, we'll talk some about that as we go forward. 
All right, so why do we wear face coverings? So source control, uh, if you've heard that, really masks contain respiratory secretions of infected individuals. Masks were originally designed uh, back, I, I, wouldn't, I guess I won't put a date on it, but it was for surgeons you know, in healthcare to, to contain their respiratory secretions when they were doing surgeries. Because you can imagine, as I've already told you, they're always develop, are generating respiratory droplets. If they're working in a person and there's an open wound, their droplets are entering that wound and you get hospital-acquired infection, which is also a huge problem. Uh, but the way they maintained that was by, or contained that was by having the surgeon wear masks. So they're originally designed for uh, source control. Um, and you've heard that term in the, um, uh, in the news as well, you know, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. And then the other one is protection, right? <clears throat> masks protect individuals from inhaling, inhaling respiratory droplets. So I'm wearing this mask to protect me from the other person. So you wear it for two reasons. I know early in the pandemic, uh, less so now, but you'd go into places like Home Depot or Walmart or wherever the case may be, and, and it would be masks are required, right? But, in, in, you know, you'd always have some individuals with the mask just looped over their ear or pulled under their chin. Um, and obviously they're not doing a very good of source control. And I know people, some people wanted to think, well, I'm not worried about getting the disease, but the reality is no one really knows if they have it. You know, you never know who you're exposed to. So this idea of source control, because you don't know you have it as an important, important item. And then for protection as well, obviously it's gonna help protect you uh, from others as well. Okay, so let's talk a little about face covering. So, and so I said the term mask, you know, was a catch-all term to describe almost any face mask. And I catch myself saying that now. There are important distinctions between all these types of devices, uh, but everybody kind of called the mask and everything gets lumped into it. But there's important uh, uh, differences that exist. So these are kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So this one here on the left is kind of your homemade face mask, or you can buy these in the store now. I think Hanes makes them and a whole bunch of other people make them as well. Then we get into the surgical mask varieties here. Face shields we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, the N95 filtering face piece respirator that comes in a variety that we'll talk about. These are the elastomask, uh, elastomask, elastomeric respirators here. And then our powered air purifying respirators uh, at the end here. There are other types. You get into like um, supplied air respirators. Um, or the spacesuit type devices. You've seen this in the movies, right? Uh, in Contagion and some of these where they have supplied airlines. We're not going to talk about those because they really don't apply to the general public. Really, the PAPRs don't really apply to the general public either, but we'll talk a little bit about those because there's an interesting thing about those that I don't think people are considering. So let's talk about masks. So um, again, designed for non-occupational settings, uh, really for source control, droplet protection. They don't seal to your face. So again, going back to that initial kind of scenario we talked about where we have droplets that are being dried, the droplet nuclei, and they stay in the air for long periods of time. This was not designed to protect against those. There were more designed to protect against that direct droplet protection, direct droplet, the droplet exposure uh, to, to respiratory droplets. Not really regulated by any government body, um, and that's why you know you can buy these anywhere, and or anybody can make their own. Um, there is really some good guidance by the CDC. If you've not been to the CDC website, I'm going to show you some pictures from the CDC website. They provide really, really good guidance on this, and so if you wanted more information, these are the links here that you can get some more information on. But the general guidance is cover nose and mouth, mouth contain two or more layers. layers fit tight to the face and be washable and breathable. And of course, there's a trade-off here, right, between breathable and, and, and having multiple layers, right, and the types of material that's used. So, um, but in general, I mean, what I found in my 14 years of research, there is no such thing as a comfortable mask or a comfortable respirator. Anytime you put something over your face, it's going to drive some level of discomfort. And it's really just something that yeah, you know, we just have to tolerate, you know, through this time when we're trying to get through this pandemic. And, you know, let's face it, healthcare workers and other occupational workers wear these all the time, and it's just a matter of you built up tolerance to them. Of course, we've seen the ridiculous as well, you know, where, you know, people can make all kinds of face mask claims, but, you know, this device obviously isn't going to be very protective uh, or do a very good job at source control. This is some information from the CDC website. Again, the similar information I've shown. I was just on their website again yesterday, and they've had some other really good graphics on here. But you know, they talk about, again, two or more layers, completely cover the nose and mouth, fit snugly against your face. 
uh, made of fabrics that are, are here's what not to choose, you know, don't use fabrics that are hard to breathe through, like vinyl, obviously you need to be able to move some air through it. We'll talk a little about exhalation valves later on, so I won't get into that here. Then they say really not to use N95 respirators. This really has to do with the shortage, right? I mean, there was, and there still is a massive shortage for N95 respirators for the healthcare industry. So they're trying to reserve those for the healthcare population. But there's some other reasons that we'll talk about today that might limit the effectiveness of N95 in a, in a, in a non-occupational setting. This is some data, and again, there's lots of papers out there. I mean, we could talk for hours on the data that's out there, but this is a 2020 paper from Fisher et al., where they did some really a pretty good study on looking at the effectiveness of face coverings uh, at limiting, uh, limiting droplets coming out of the person's mouth. So this was using human volunteers. I don't remember the duration of the study here, but this is a standard condition where they start with a N95 respirator, and then there's a variety of materials here that they've tested that all do a pretty good job at source control. Again, we're looking at source control here. You get into a couple here at the end, which is kind of like a bandana, and then there's the control, and then you have this neck gaiter, which has turned out to be worse than all of them. Uh, so there are some materials that obviously are not very good uh, at source control, and then this is depicted on this graph here where they're showing the individual measurement and then your accumulation over time with the, um, you know, the control being here and then the, the uh, neck gaiter being here and your other materials here showing, uh, again, just another graphical representation of, you know, some of these materials are really good at source control and would be very breathable as well and tolerable for individuals. So let's talk a little bit about getting into surgical face masks and what we'll call a procedure mask. <clears throat> so um, again, these were designed for use in the healthcare setting um, for, as we mentioned earlier, to, um, to prevent you know, uh, you know, so, uh, hospital-acquired infections or the healthcare worker from an infect in a patient. However, since that time, the FDA has put regulations in under 21 CFR 878 on surgical apparel to make sure that they protect the healthcare worker at all. And generally it's around splash protection. They don't want, you know, blood or other products splashing onto these devices and soaking through to the healthcare worker and infecting them through the skin route or through the uh, oral route as well. So, so this is um, three levels of protection from, uh, and it's just defined in ASTM 2100s and it really comes on to, Again, it's, it's the amount of different pressure settings and things they use to determine the um, amount of splash protection from these devices. So, uh, so this is an example of, a, of what I would call a surgical mask. So you see the surgeon usually has ties, it's tied on, it's tied tight to your face. Um, if you look at this next device, which we showed a picture of, this is what really would be defined more as a procedural mask. The loops over the ears tend to be called procedural masks versus surgical masks. It's important to note that um, while for the folks in the hospital, for either of these, they are FDA approved. And if you go to like a McK the McKesson website, if you will, you'll see a 510K number for these, or a 510, say it's 510K approved, which means it's FDA approved, or it'll give an ASTM uh, performance specification on those. Um, however, if you go to uh, Amazon site, so this is a this is a, for a product I took off Amazon. It's you know this is the disclaimer on that. It says statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the FDA. So I don't know what that really means, but what I think they're trying to say is this is not an FDA approved device. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad device. It's just important you understand that just because it looks like something that's worn in the healthcare industry, it wasn't necessarily approved by the FDA uh, for use. So really it's just a knowledge base uh, for you all so you understand that uh, what you're buying and, and you know, if you're looking for something that is has that FDA stamp of approval, you may be able to get it. Again, I don't know for sure if those are even available. Um, but uh, again, just for your knowledge to so you understand how these devices are being regulated. We go on to look at face shields. Um, so face shields are by and large, uh, you know, fall under the, um, ANSI, uh, ANSI standards here, and really it's not just face shields. ANSI does all kinds of specifications for other things related to eye shield for goggles, and it's not just about, you know, protecting from bacteria. It's, you know, it's protected against fragments, and you, know, you can imagine if you're a welder or if you're working on a grinding stone or something, uh, that that face shield needs to meet certain specifications for to make sure it's impact resistance and doesn't fog, and you can see through it in those things. So. 
In the context of the pandemic, clearly it's trying to be used for source control. Does it actually contain droplets from someone's mouth uh, coming out? And then protection, does it actually protect you from other people that are infected? So the CDC currently does not recommend face shields as substitutes for masks, and there's not a lot of data out there. Um, but there is some that I'll actually walk you through a couple studies that I saw that are interesting. Um, the ANSI-approved uh, products, you can buy, buy them on um, Amazon. They're more expensive, but they are available. Um, opposed to, um, there's much cheaper devices as well, and I'll show you a picture of mine that um, you know, people were making a lot of money selling really not, not, not high-quality devices, you might say, uh, and clearly they were not ANSI-approved. This is a study done by Lindsley et al. So Bill Lindsley works at NIOSH uh, in the uh, National Personal Protection Technology Laboratory. Um, in 2014, this, so they're really interested in influenza here. So this was a mannequin-based study where he has a mannequin here, a cough simulator that's producing droplets. I believe that they were using influenza for this study, but I'm not entirely sure, um, but some sort of droplet with the detection on it. Then they had a, a mannequin over here on the right. You can see the distances they tested at here, where then they're determining the amount of droplets or particles that actually enter the respiratory zone of this mannequin here. And what they found is, is that face shields are pretty effective at limiting spread of the uh, droplets and, and, and aerosols to the user of the face shield. So you can see here on their histogram here, where the unprotected condition here and the white bars the protected condition is actually down here in the gray bars here with the, obviously the darker gray bars are showing um, impaction onto the device itself, but they show greater than 96% reduction in exposure to droplets. So that's actually pretty good. And I think surprised some people when you actually read this because you know, the face shield is so open, how does it possibly protect? But again, when you think about droplet exposure, these large droplets actually going to from one individual from this guy here or gal here, on the left, impacting the face shield, that makes sense. And as far as those particles that remain airborne in the air, they don't necessarily travel to this person. They're going to follow air currents in the air. So, so some of this is obviously test uh, setup uh, specific as well. Um, and the conditions, whether it was, you know, wind was blowing one direction or the other, would certainly influence that as well. The next study I just talked about is from Siddhartha. So this is uh, obviously 2020 as well. Uh, just recently came out, and if you followed the news, you saw all these fantastic, you know, uh, uh, videos. This is some stills of some of these videos that are done here. So this is a simulated cough using these laser sheet um, uh, uh, devices, which are which are which are kind of very very good. They provide very good visuals here. But it's a simulated sneeze, right? Simulated sneeze or cough where this person's coughing, you get this big blast of air here, and then this is kind of over time what's happening as well. So clearly, you know, again, from a droplet perspective, you can imagine many of the droplets are impacted on the face shield. Some of these other ones may also be droplets that are eventually transmitting, or they may be going to a aerosol state where they may spread rapidly and diffuse into the room. So anyway, um, if you get a chance, you can go to, you know, the link here or just Google this, and then they actually have the videos of these playing as well, and so uh, they're kind of dramatic, dramatic images. All right, so let's talk about the N95 filtering face piece respirator. So the first thing I see is a lot of people will call these masks because they look a lot like masks, right? They look like the, you know, paper, plastic type products, if you will. But this is actually a respirator, and that's just a very distinct thing versus a mask. So first of all, this is designed for occupational settings to reduce exposure to airborne contaminants. The biggest thing here is a fit test is required. So we talked again about the droplet transmission, droplets going from one person to another person, which is which the masks um, do a good job of, of uh, uh, preventing. Uh, but when you have these aerosols produced in the air where you're just hanging in the air, the, the prevalence is that they might be inhaled and go around the sides of the of the respirator, which we call total inward leakage. So it's not just penetration through the device, it's leakage around the device as well. So a fit test is required to make sure you don't get leakage around the device. So this is an example of a, a picture of a fit test here where, again, I don't know if any of these have done this, but you put this hood on after you don the device and then they spray a banana oil or a Bittrex or something like that in there. And then the user is required to go through a variety of exercises, and if they don't smell the 
the contaminant put in there, again, then they know that the device fits well. And so, um, again, it's a very important step uh, for uh, ensuring that this device functions as is needed. So this is very highly regulated by NIOSH under 42 CFR 84. For the uh, ones used in healthcare, the FDA does regulate those as well, although there has been a memorandum uh, MOU between FDA and NIOSH to kind of simplify that process. If you're an employer and you require your re uh, employees to wear respirators, then you must have a OSHA a mandated program for respiratory protection under 29 CFR 1910. That's really important. You know, when we think about, we, we have one here for our employees that do um, 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 various things, whether it's, you know, particulates or vapors or whatever the case may be, but the, these are devices designed to save people's lives, right? They're, they're intentionally exposing themselves to hazards, and if these don't fun function properly, I mean, they essentially put their lives at risk in many situations. So it's really important for this OSHA-mandated safety program to be in place. Um, and again, if you go to Amazon, there are many products that have similar characteristics of these but are not NIOSH-approved. So you see this NIOSH approved number here, you see the TC number here, that means this is clearly a NIOSH approved device. If it doesn't have that, it means NIOSH has not approved it. These come in all shapes and sizes and forms, as you might imagine. This is just a few examples. We did a big study for the FDA uh, a while back on disinfection of these devices, so we've looked at many of them. Um, these are all approved by NIOSH and approved by the FDA with the exception of this one here. Um, and you can see there's a great diversity and great variety and it probably needed to fit the variety of faces. All I can tell you that some of these don't fit anybody. <laughs> and really it's up to the, again, the employer under an OSHA mandated program to make sure they fit. It's not necessarily the manufacturer's responsibility to make sure it fits a specific person because as you look around and you go out, the anthropometric diversity, the facial dimensions of people are so vastly different that you, know, you need a variety here. These N95 filtering face piece respirators sometimes come with uh, uh, valves here, and if you probably heard that, exhalation valves in the news as well. Uh, and the intent is to help you know, uh, ventilate the device, although they don't necessarily work so great in the N95 filtering face piece respirators as they do in the next version that we're going to talk about. But I'll come back to exhalation valves so you understand how that works uh, going forward. So the next one we're going to talk about is the half mass elastomeric respirators. Now I see people out and about wearing these as well, and so um, fewer folks, but they're out there as well. Um, and so they're typically an elastomeric device with a head strap. They come with a variety of different canister types that you can put on for the given hazard you're working against. So it might be particulate like this one. It might be you know a carbon canister if you were worried about fumes or whatever there's you know there's a whole host of different types of canisters for the for the event you're looking at it is important that you know obviously if you're trying to protect from particulates you have the particulate canister on here the particulate cartridge on here same thing with this a fit test is required to ensure proper fit to your face and again regulated highly regulated by NIOSH and then same thing you need an OSHA regulated program FDA does not currently regulate these due to many reasons, although I would expect that to change going forward as to becoming more prevalent in the healthcare setting. Um, and then the big thing here is the CDC. The CDC does not recommend using respirators with exhalation valves. And so just go to the next slide here. You know, if you look at this, is some common ones, again, that we've done research on. There's a whole host of them out there. But all of these have exhalation valves. So the valve is here. This is hidden behind the thing here. You, know, you can see in the circles here where the valves are. And the way these valves work are like this, right? So the valve, again, is hidden here. This is kind of just take this apart. This is the guts of this device. Um, so this flap, as you inhale, seals closed, and it's a very effective seal. It's actually almost, it's really, uh, I like to play with it <laughs> because it so, seals so well. One of my uh, things I do when I uh, get stressed out. Um, and then as you exhale, the valve is pushed open. And again, the CDC is saying that, well, if you are exhaling these droplets out and they're unfiltered, then um, it may not be great for source control. And so we've not only seen this at the CDC, but we've heard stories of people not getting, not being able to get on airlines with respirators, with exhalation valves. We've heard that different uh, communities, you know, whatever the case may be, won't let people in, store in, you know, in their, their place of business or government with exhalation valves. So it's something that's got a lot of press uh, uh, about these exhalation valves. 
Now this next device, this is also elastomeric respirator. This is actually the device that we're developing for um, healthcare workers, and it was specifically designed without, uh, designed without an exhalation valve. So these two filter cartridges, you know, large volume filter cartridges set in the mask, and then the user, the air comes into the device and all their uh, exhale breath is pushed out through those filters as well. So you eliminate this issue of exhalation valves and provide source control. And again, it really makes sense for a healthcare setting. And then there's, there's all kinds of other features of this device that we won't get into that really make it ideal for healthcare settings, but also other occupational settings uh, as well. Mention this Project Breathe, which is better respirator equipment using advanced technologies for healthcare employees. This was a big study done in 2009 to really People understood that the products used by healthcare workers really wasn't you know, meeting their needs. So this study was put out, and then we've kind of filled the gap to actually develop this device and hopefully bring it to market you know, later this year or early next year. All right, let's talk about PAPRs a little bit. So powered air purifying respirator. So the way this device works is this is a fan unit with filters in it that actually provides supplied air through this hose into the hood area of this, so it's essentially it's over-pressurizing this, this, the area where you would respire so that when you inhale, you're always enough air in there so that you never, um, never have any um, total limber leakage of this device. These provide very high uh, protection levels because of the high-velocity air provided into the hood of this device. Um, the, um, the, well, let me, I'll come back to that statement. Um, they're also regulated by NIOSH. Uh, they do not require a fit test because there's no fit required. It's an overpressure device, so there's no fit required. The FDA currently does not regulate them. The interesting thing about this device is we talk about source control. It's clearly doing a good job of containing droplets, but if you were someone that had a, you know, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic was using one of these devices, you know, the overpressure would would force all of their particles out into the open air without any filtration. So it's interesting that, you know, no one really is talking about that in the news because we know these are being used in healthcare. And I, of course, I have a lot of friends in hospitals that, you know, know this as well. And it's uh, just something that's not being addressed uh, very well right now. But, um, you know, ho hopefully, hopefully, um, well, I'm sure the hospitals are doing a good job of, of maintaining their staff to the best of their ability. Um, this is just some more examples of, Papper. So this is one with an external fan with the external cartridges here. You know, you typically wear this on your belt, and then there's a battery that wells on your belt, and then the, you know, the hose from there up to the the, the hood here. This is the one I just showed. This is an interesting one. This this Syntec. This is actually what we call the capper. All of the all of these components are actually located in the helmet of the device, so you don't have all the, you know, super, superfluous. You know, parts hanging off your 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 waist and whatnot, so it's all contained in the helmet. It's a little bit heavy, um, but that's the trade-off from you know having all these different parts and hoses and whatnot. So and they all work work pretty well. We we've worked with many with all these devices uh, extensively. These are very expensive devices. Um, you know, thousands of dollars. You know, pre-pandemic. I don't know what they are during the pandemic. Uh, so you know, it's not something you would see in the um, for a consumer setting, but um, it's just provided here as a, another, another type of device that's out there. So we just summarize here, and we talk about um, the different masks and uh, face coverings here. So the face mask, again, oversight, and there's really no oversight. The CDC does provide good guidance, and I would suggest their website is really well done. Um, good for source control and droplet protection. So initially, the CDC came out and said only good for source control. They recently come out and said also good for droplet protection as well. Uh, based on some um, uh, studies that were done and, or some, it might have been even a, uh, I think it was actually oh, looking at some real data from uh, infection spread. So, so I think there's some good data to support that. Targeted at the consumer, surgical mask, procedural mask, again, regulated by FDA and ASTM by and large for um, those devices used in hospitals, the ones that are you're buying on Amazon probably are not regulated by FDA or ASTM, but that doesn't mean they're not good. I mean, I'm not making a, a, a declaration of whether the products are good or not. I'm just trying to make, let you make sure you understand, you know, who's actually overseeing these devices. So source control and droplet protection, just like these, again, targeted the healthcare and consumer. Face Shields ANSI does a good job of providing the standards to work towards. Again, CDC says not to replace masks. Some of the literature will support that they are good for droplet protection. We'll talk a little bit about source control when I get into our OSHA study here. Again, targeted all, all, all 
all segments of the consumer world. In 95 FFRs, again, regulated by NIOSH and the FDA. Again, make sure they say NIOSH approved on them. Good for source control, drop of protection. Then we add aerosol protection, right? This, so this is that airborne thing that you've heard about. As long as it's properly fitted, it will give you aerosol protection. Elastomeric respirators, uh, NIOSH, again, the FDA doesn't really play in this world yet, but I expect them to. And again, the same thing here, we take off aerosol protection because of the exhalation valves, except for those models that obviously don't have exhalation valves. And I expect more of those to come on the market too. There was one just recently approved by NIOSH. We hope ours is the next, uh, but we're working through that process now. And then PAPRs as well, the most expensive devices that are out there, aerosol protection and droplet protection. Again, not source control. It's just not the way those devices operate. Okay. So last thing here, and then I'll, we'll get to questions, is to talk a little bit about this source control study that we're doing. And so the idea behind this study um, was to have a droplet producer and collector within the normal respiration six feet apart. So this is actually set at four feet apart, and there's actually a great deal of science that goes into your communication zones, if you will. So if you want to look that up, it's like zero to two feet is the intimate zone, and then four, you know, two to Four is a normal communication, and you get over six, you get to, to you know, more standoff communications, if you will. So, but what we wanted to do was simulate that CDC standard condition. So it's 15 minutes at less than six feet. And so this guy here, this mannequin on the right, actually has his droplet. This says he's producing droplets through a droplet generator, and they're spiked with DNA, uh, some small segments of DNA that we've created. And we let him breathe, and this one also has a breathing machine here that breathes at a normal rate as well. Um, and then we just let this run for 15 minutes, and we want to see how many droplets from this mannequin actually ends up uh, on this mannequin. And we've actually done some other things where we played coupons in between. We've placed coupons on the head form here and coupons on the head form here. And then we've done it under multiple conditions where there's no, no device in place. And then we've used the cloth mask, we've used the surgical mask, and we've used the face shield. So. So again, I hope to have all this data to tell you about today, but actually I just saw it last night. And there are some kind of very interesting things that came out of this that might should be obvious, but I'll just kind of give you a high level summary of what happened. So the first thing is when you wear a, a mask like this or a face shield, your face becomes heavily contaminated with, with, with um, if, you, if you were an asymptomatic spreader or pre-symptomatic spreader, your face would become very heavily contaminated with the virus because not all the, not all the air just pushes through the mask. And you, you've probably seen this for people when they wear glasses and their glasses fog up. Well, that's respiratory droplets and respiratory secretions that are going up to fog their glasses. So um, it's important to note that that is happening. And so, 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 you know, we talk about hand hygiene and maybe face hygiene should be something that's added to that uh, as well. And then we also find for different devices, so for instance, if I was to put a face shield on this guy, the where his contamination, his face might be less contaminated, but his neck and chest region might be more contaminated uh, as well. So, so I think the study that we've done will be very interesting and provide some, some level of thought that maybe we haven't quite thought through as far as, you know, how we use masks going forward and some of the things we should do in general, you know, when we wear masks, because again, if you're if your face becomes contaminated and you're not washing your face, but you you know you rub your face and then you're making food for somebody, you have to potentially to spread that disease through a fomite. So, so again, we hope that publicate well that publication will come out this year, and we'd be happy to share that with folks um, uh, if they would like. Uh, just let us know. So just to summarize, uh, again, COVID-19 is primarily spread through respiratory droplets, and again, I th if you took anything from this presentation today, it's that. Respiratory droplets are always being exchanged between people. So it's not, you may not see them, you may not feel them, but it's happening. Again, uh, asymptomatic and presymptomatic spreaders are the real problem here. And, you know, you could be the spreader of this disease. You don't know your, you don't know your, you have the disease until you actually get the symptom. I can tell you in our office, we've had, you know, three, four cases now where, you know, someone comes down to this where they're perfectly healthy the day before. And um, so we, you know, we make a case to pr practice to wear masks and social distance in the office and for that reason, because you just don't know. Face coverage provide an effective means to protect you and others. I mean, I think it's clear that that is the case. There's some caveats, obviously, that we just talked about with this study that we're doing, maybe to add uh, some other um, thought process to it. But again, 
just because you're using a face mask doesn't mean you're you're you know you shouldn't be using good hand hygiene as well and so and doing the things you need to to make sure your hands are clean um, again, no regulations exist on you know, the consumer face masks, if you will, but use common sense and follow the CDC guidelines. The CDC really has done a good job of putting out some really good information. As far as face shield goes, I mean, I'm just going to say more data is needed um, on this. Um, I think for droplet protection, you know, obviously the Lindsley study showed us that it does a good job of protection. The data that we have on source control, I just haven't went through it enough detail to, to comment on that at this point, but that'll be in the publication we put out later this year. And then if you're using something like an N95 respirator or elastomeric respirator, um, you really need a fit test you know, for aerosol protection. They're obviously going to be good for droplet control just like a mask would, but if you're expecting it to have aerosol protection, you know, airborne protection, then it really needs to be fit tested or you need to be fit tested to the device. Um, so that's all I have. So I appreciate everybody's attention. Hopefully I didn't run over. I wasn't tracking the time, but uh, uh, pleasure to be here, and I'll take any questions you may have. Yeah, next slide, please. Brian, we'll get to questions in a minute. Okay, thanks, Brian. That was a great presentation. I mean, like everything in life, mass that uh, from a layperson, which I'm one of millions, tens of billions, it's quite simple, but you uh, educated us all. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get into the Q&A program, we do have a number of questions. I want to share with you a little bit of information on some of the upcoming webinars. Just as a reminder, we're getting very close to the two-year anniversary of the first introduction of the program that was way back in uh, February 2019. The other thing that you may have noticed if you've been joining this webinar series either periodically or since the beginning now hovering over two years is that we strive to provide a diverse range of topics. One of the things I failed to mention was Brian is our division manager. He serves in that role at our Panama City, Florida office. And uh, a lot of people, if you work in transportation and infrastructure such as I do, think of ARA as a transportation company. If you work in Homeland Security and DOD side, you think of ARA in that capacity. ARA actually has five different business sectors. Now, uh, just briefly about upcoming webinars. January 27th, remember webinar Wednesdays are on what day of the week? Of course, on Wednesdays. My good friend, Mike Carroll uh, from our uh, Champaign, Illinois office and Alex Siva uh, from our Toronto office will talk about paved trail management for cyclists and pedestrians. Now, has anybody tried to buy a bicycle during the pandemic? I've, uh, we had some hurricane damage and several of the bikes at our home were damaged. And I had a heck of a time replacing those bicycles. So bicycles are in shortage. That's the sad end. The good end is that everybody's getting a lot more exercise. February 24th. We'll again shift gears and topics, and we're going to discuss uh, transportation research programs, the value-added component, some example case study success stories, and a recipe for program management for success. That'll be presented by my good colleagues, Jason Bittner from our Wisconsin office, and Kevin Elliott, who resides in our Panama City, Florida office. And these are just a few of the upcoming ones that go through uh, March 24th. We'll move to safety and we'll look at Florida Department of Transportation's enhanced hydroplaning prediction model and my good friend Matteo will be presenting that. Now, just before we move on to Q&A, remind everybody we've got presentations and we have presenters lined up through the fall of this year. Next slide, please. Okay, um, just a couple items on Q&A to begin with. Like all of our presenters, Brian has been gracious and shared his email address with you. So feel free to follow up and communicate with him as you go along if you have questions that are not addressed with the time that's allotted for today. So Brian, the first question is, how often should fabric masks be washed? Right, so again, the CDC provides guidance on mask washage, and so I think they're recommended daily 
to wash it daily. Um, so, but I would say go to the CDC website uh, to to get their guidance on it. But you can't wash it too much. You can't wash it too often, right? It, it does have the potential to act as a fomite and be a touch spread of the disease, if you will. So I think the CDC recommends daily. Okay. Um, next question is: Is a KN95 mask as effective as an N95 mask? So that is a great question. So the the KN95 mask. So I've heard horror stories about the KN95 mask, and and there may be good lots and there may be bad lots. So. It's important to know that the KN95 is not approved by NIOSH, or at least not that I'm aware of. So the FDA uh, approved emergency youth authorization to allow KN95 to be used, uh, you know, basically not NIOSH approved respirators in the United States. Um, and then the other thing to keep bear in mind with the KN95, I see some with ear loops versus some that have the head straps on them. So again, it depends on what we're talking about. If you're talking about droplet protection, if you're trying to protect yourself from droplets, it'll probably be effective or as effective as a as a as a mask would be. If it if you're talking about you know work using it as a respirator, again where it's a tight fitting seal uh, where it needs to be fitted to your face, then a fit test would be required as well, and that's really how you would know if it was any good or not. Is actually you'll get a fit test on it, but. I've heard a lot of bad stories about the KN95s, and, and so I'll probably just leave it at that before I, before I say too much there. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Another question. Um, what's known about the life expectancy of virus nuclei in a room? Is it humidity or airflow exchange dependent? Well, so there's been a lot of studies now on the stability of the virus on surfaces and the stability of viruses in air, right? So on surfaces, we know it decays relatively rapidly, but if you put a large enough dose on, so if I put seven or eight logs on a surface, uh, the data I've seen that the virus is very heat stable, and, and so you can detect virus, I think, up to 24 hours later, although there are papers out there that would do more justice to what I'm talking about right now. As far as the stability in air, I don't know the answer to that. The, the CDC has, has not come out and said that the that the virus is airborne, meaning that it is stable in air and transmitted through that route. But there is some controversy out there, and there are some research believe that it does spread that way. So um, um, I'm probably not the right person to, to directly address that question. Okay, thank you. Even though you're not the right person, you gave a good good response. Next question. Um, I don't wear a mask because I'm concerned about contaminating my hands when I touch it. Would you please comment on that? Well, so as I talked earlier, so when you wear a ma when you when you when you wear a mask, um, it's to prevent that droplet spread, right? So I'm I'm in a room with someone, and I have droplets going from you know potentially infected asymptomatic person to me. The efficiency of that transfer is very great, right? I'm going to have an infected droplet from someone that's going directly into my respiratory tract, which sounds kind of gross, but let's face it, that's what happens, right? Um, as far as worrying about getting the virus from, you know, touching the mask. Um, so a few, few things to consider there. One is you should always be using good hand hygiene, right? So even if you're touching your mask, before you do anything else, you should be using good hand hygiene. So hand sanitizers, bar of soap and water is by far the best. But also bear in mind there's an efficiency of transfer issue as well, right? So the virus, first of all, deposits on your mask. It starts to decay when it dies. So there is a kind of rapid decay process. And then for you to actually touch the mask and get it onto your hands, there's an efficiency of transfer. And for porous surfaces, we know it's not really very good. Um, and then once it's on your fingers, it needs to transfer to another surface, either your mouth, but you, know, you shouldn't be putting your hands in your mouth. But let's say to a piece of food, there's an efficiency of transfer loss there. So, so if you did a risk analysis, you know, when I've done this, I said, you know, it's much more risky not to wear a mask and worry about droplets directly deposited into my respiratory tract versus wear a mask and potentially worry about, you know, you know, viruses spreading from the mask to my hands to something else into my mouth. So so that's the guidance I would provide for. If you do a risk analysis, better to wear a mask. Okay, next next question, and we'll continue for about another three minutes or so of questions. May not get through all of them. I perform a user seal check on my respirator. Is that as effective as the fit test that you referred to in the presentation? 
Right, so the user seal check uh, is defined, to is used to determine the fit that you get at the given time that you put it on. It's a safety check, if you will, to make sure that it still fits properly uh, when you actually wear it. However, it does not replace a fit test. So the fit test is a comprehensive process uh, where it's, that, that OSHA defines the, the process. It's about a 20-minute process you go to where, if you remember that guy with the hood on and they're spraying that, that stuff in there, this person then has to do a variety of exercises, turn their head right and left, bend over, you know, put their head up and down to make sure that it, that seal is effective uh, for the different types of activities that you'd be doing. There's a, there's a something called the rainbow speech you have to talk, you have to say as well that basically makes you um, have all of the uh, uh, your face makes all the motions it would make for any any kind of speech you would have. So so it does not does not replace the a fit test, and so although although it's a it's a good confirmatory test that it's sealing the way it's supposed to, but you still need to get a fit test done. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, a uh, bit of a long question. Our State Department of Public Health does not consider an exposure to have occurred if both individuals were wearing masks. I believe that is also the guidance from the CDC. Has this research been found to be accurate? Okay, so if I understood that right, um, can you just read that again? Because I want to make sure I get the first part uh, yeah, of that absolutely. right. Absolutely. So uh, succinctly, the question is: Is their their public health department does not consider an exposure to have occurred if both individuals were wearing masks? And okay, this right. person who's asking the question believes that's also the position of the CDC. Has that research been found to be accurate? Right. So we just went through this because we had an exposure in the building. And unless the CDC just changed their guidance, um, their guidance is based on uh, so so when when someone needs to quarantine uh, is based on that 15 minutes uh, at less than six feet, regardless of whether they're wearing masks. And so unless that was changed, that's what was on the CDC website last week. Now, the World Health Organization is different. The World, World Health Organization says if you're wearing masks, then the exposure has not occurred. So, so I think there's some confliction there. Now, the state bodies may have their own, the states may have their own um, position on that. But uh, again, based on my review of the CDC, which again was just last week, um, uh, again, they, they consider an exposure if you spent more than 15 per minutes with someone at less than six feet. Okay. Thank you. And we have time for one more quick question, which is uh, a, a humorous one. If you can answer this, when can we stop wearing face masks? Oh, <laughs> that is a good one. Um, well, this is what I tell my people around here. It's like, you know, we're still in the pandemic and you can see things are getting worse, right? I mean, it's still, this thing is spreading. You know, people have different opinions on the mortality rate, and but but clearly people are dying from this thing. You know, through the certain uh, age groups uh, that are that are being affected. We made it through the summer. The worst time possible to wear a mask. You made it through, right? I mean, we I live in Florida, and we were wearing our masks outside, 90 degrees, 90 percent humidity, and so uh, we made it through that. So I just tell people, just keep wearing your masks until the CD says otherwise. It's the easiest part of the year to wear a mask. And for most of you folks, it's cold. So um, just keep it up for a while longer. I think this will be behind us. Next year at this time, hopefully this will all be behind us. Okay, that's great. And we do have a few more questions, but we need to move on. Next slide, please. So we do... Um, provide one hour of professional development um, credits for uh, joining each of our webinars. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who joined today for um, joining this very informative webinar. Like all of our presentations, today's presentation is being recorded and a link will be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday site next week. Now. Uh, you, I mentioned professional development hours, and the recommendations or the policy we're following now is a, a PDH certificate is granted to all participants that are verified by our attendance report. Uh, that means that you've attended the entire hour of the webinar. So a copy, finally on this slide, a copy of today's presentation in PDF form 
will be uh, is also available. And please uh, allow a, a several weeks for you to receive your certificate. You can download a copy of the presentation again in PDF form only. So hopefully that addresses those types of questions, which are common questions. Finally, last slide, please. This is almost my seventh year anniversary with ARA. After two retirements, one from the federal government and one from the National Academies. I can attest personally, Jerry DiMaggio, that ARA is a great company to work for. We're always looking for great people. Paraphrasing our mission statement somewhat, or our logo is we work on science and engineering the most difficult and complex problems for fun and profit in that order. So if you're interested in learning more about opportunities for employment, please visit the web uh, address that you see on this particular slide. Finally, in concluding, I'd like to thank you on behalf of ARA, Brian and myself. Have a blessed and a joyous holiday season. Remember, January 27th, we're looking forward to see you again. You don't have to ride your bicycle for that one.